All right, this is our course for Old Testament wisdom literature. Today we're going to do an introduction to wisdom literature, and I'm going to probably do a very brief kind of survey introduction to each of the, of the books that are part of the wisdom literature, which and we'll talk about what those books are because any book you open that talks about wisdom literature will probably have a list that's not the same as some other one because there's a question as to what constitutes wisdom literature. And I'll talk about that. But today we'll do an introduction. Next week we will talk about the book of Job, one of the uh, most important books in, in human literature, not just in the Bible. The book of Job has been probably more influential uh, than any other document ever written with regard to the issue of suffering, especially unexplained suffering, you know, suffering of the innocent. And so we'll talk about the book of Job. The following week, the, the day we would meet is April 17th. That's Holy Week. So we will not meet during Holy Week. We have a Monday Thursday service in the afternoon, and here at our church, a Good Friday service. Both of those are at 5 o'clock. And so Holy Week is the most important time of the Christian year, so we will not be meeting then. The following week, the week uh, April 24th, we will have the Book of Psalms Part 1. The Book of Psalms Part 2 will be on May 1st. May 8th, we will not have class. Carolyn and I have an obligation taking us out of the country. And so we will not meet on May 8th. It's, I, I think it's kind of great. We'll have two classes and then a week off, and two classes and then a week off. Okay? Get, let you catch up on your reading and me on my preparation for teaching. And then starting on May 15th to the end of the, of the month of May, we will have the Book of Proverbs, the Book of Ecclesiastes, and then the Song of Songs, or Song of Solomon. We'll talk about that too. There are about a half dozen different names for that book. Um, and then the final exam. As always, I will seek by May 15th to have the what you need to know from this class notes finished so that you will have a couple weeks to study them. All right? Um, any questions about that? Bless you. Questions? Comments? Okay. If you've been in our Old Testament survey class or any of the previous classes, I've talked about the fact that in the Hebrew Bible, the Hebrew Bible called also the Tanakh, it's called the Tanakh because it is a, a, a compression of the three Hebrew words for the three sections that the Jewish people identify in the Hebrew Bible. The first section, what we call the Law, the first five books uh, of Moses, they call the Torah. You, you've heard that expression, even if you haven't been in my classes probably. The second section are the, the Prophets, which is Nevaim in Hebrew. And the third section is called the writings, which is Ketuvim. Well, if you take Torah, Nevaim, Ketuvim, push them all together, you get Tanakh. And Tanakh is the usual name that the Hebrew people, the Jewish people, use for the, their Hebrew Bible, which is our Old Testament. It is exactly the same content between the Hebrew Bible and our Christian Old Testament, except it's rearranged differently and broken up differently. But all the same stuff in it, all right? Now, the third section, uh, the writings, or Ketuvim, you will notice, include the books of Psalms, Proverbs, Job, Song of Songs, and Ecclesiastes, although they come into different subsections. Um, the first three are part of the Megillot, the, uh, um, the, I'm sorry, the first two, the first three are part of the books of truth, and then the, uh, the last two of what we're calling the books of wisdom are the Song of Songs and Ecclesiastes are part of the five megalot, or the five scrolls that are read during, during Jewish holidays. The way that we Christians break up the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, is in four different sections. Same material, but broken up differently. We think in terms of the law is the same. The first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, that's what Pentateuch means, five books, or the five-part book. Then we have the 12 books of history, which we just finished studying last term, which that was like two days ago, right, that we finished that. <laughs> Boy, it sure seemed like March went fast. Uh, Joshua through Esther. Then there is a section which we call the wisdom literature. It is five books, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Solomon or Song of Psalms. That's what we're studying now. And then we have 17 books of prophecy from Isaiah through Malachi. We sometimes break it up into the major prophets and minor prophets, not because the major prophets are more important, but because they're longer. So, in teaching these classes, I did them sort of in order of theological importance, rather than the sequence that they occur. I started with the Pentateuch, which are the books of the law, which are by far the most important to Jews and, and 
Christians alike. The, they both tell the, the history of the beginning, the creation of the world, the fall of humanity, um, and the story of the patriarchs, all the way up through the giving of the law, the application of the law, etc. So that's that's the most important part. There are some sections of the Jewish community over the, the centuries that have not accepted any of the Hebrew Bible as being completely authoritative and divine other than the Pentateuch. But everybody has always known that one was important. So we started with that. I then skipped to prophecy because the prophets convey the actual word of God to, to the Jewish people through their history. In fact, quite commonly, not only in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, they will refer to the Law and the Prophets as a shorthand way of talking about the Old Testament. Because Law and Prophets are the most important parts of it. The, uh, the written Law represented in the Pentateuch, and the spoken Law through the Prophets came coming through the books of prophecy. We then looked at the history books. The history books sort of overlay all that because it's when things happened in the history of the, of the Jewish people. The events through which the prophets spoke, etc. And then finally, but not unimportant, but still theologically uh, not as as critical to us as the Law and the Prophets, are the books we're studying now, which are the books of wisdom. Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, or Song of Solomon. Okay, any questions about that? All right. This also is a chart I've used. You've seen some of this stuff before, but you know what? It helps you to see it again. And to also know that this is online. This is part of the material that you can access online. Uh, we are dealing, oops, wrong button. This is, a, this is a new remote, and the buttons are very close together. We are dealing right now with the five books of wisdom. Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. Okay? And that will be the last section. We've already dealt with all the rest of this stuff. Okay? Um, it is worth starting by saying that not all... Uh, sources or scholars refer to these as the books of wisdom. That's the first thing. Wisdom literature, I'm going to talk about it a little bit, is a, is a particular genre that goes back to 2700 BC in some ancient cultures. Egypt had a, a genre which they called the wisdom literature. It is the writing of the sages, wisdom for a living life. Again, we'll get into details. But the Hebrew literature, which we call wisdom literature, does not, by most scholars, uh, estimation, the genre of wisdom literature does not include all five of these books. The genre of liter wisdom literature is considered to be Job, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes. The Song of Songs, which is how I usually refer to it, because it's shorter, is often included. The Book of Psalms, only parts of it are included, and I'll talk about the parts of it in a few minutes, in a little bit. But for the sake of breaking the, the Bible down into sections that, that fit together better, we call, the, and, and, and some scholars, for instance, um, Hubbard and um, Lasor, which is one of, they, David Allen Hubbard was one of my Old Testament professors at seminary, William Sanford Lasor had left just before I got there, but it, he still had a lot of influence on the Old Testament uh, studies at, at Fuller. They refer to these as the books of poetry. Because only some of them, because they're all written either in completely or in the majority in poetic form, and the um, some of them, only some of them are considered actually the genre of wisdom literature. But the most common way of referring to these five books is that they are the books of wisdom. Because they are different in form and in intent than either the law or the prophets or the history books, as we'll get into it now. The... Um, the Jewish word for wisdom, which is uh, uh, chokhmah, literally means skill for living. And that's what these books are all about. The books of wisdom in the Jewish uh, Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, are intended to provide guidance for moral behavior and everyday living. They're some of the most beautiful sections of the whole Bible. They're, they're fairly difficult in most cases to sit down and just read through. Unlike a history book where, you know, there's a sequence of events, you, you sit down and you read Proverbs and it's beautiful, but it's like one aphorism. An aphorism is a one-liner. In many cases, it's like one aphorism after another. How many of those can you read before it all starts to blur together, right? So it's not easy to sit down and read through long sections of the wisdom writings, but they are beautifully written. Some of them are very challenging as well. And uh, we'll 
talk about Job and Ecclesiastes. Um, but within the broad categories of wisdom literature that we're looking at, um, the Hebrew wisdom literature differs than other kinds of wisdom literature in the ancient Near East. You'll hear me talk about the ancient Near East, A and E. That means basically what we know today as the Middle East only a long time ago. The difference is the Near East, it was called the ancient Near East back when the point of reference was Greece. And then when the point of reference moved to Rome, it became, you know, not the Near East, but the Middle East, as opposed to the Far East, which is China. Okay. So the ancient Near East are the ancient civilizations, both the Hebrew people, but also, you know, the Hittite and Egyptian and all the others that were in that region. Well, the ancient Near East literature, the genre of, biblical, of wisdom, um, is different than the biblical books of wisdom, because the biblical books of wisdom all have their focus and center on God not just on the sages, the wise men, you know, the, the, the smart things that people have thought to tell you about how to live your life. The Hebrew wisdom literature is all oriented toward God, and Proverbs 1.7 sort of defines that for us by saying, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. So the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. It starts with an assumed existence of God in the wisdom literature. But then, you do not get a lot of, thus saith the Lord. You don't have prophetic statements. You don't have a lot of um, quotations from the Mosaic Law. Instead, all of that is assumed, but then the wisdom literature is talking about, okay, how do we live our lives? And all of that is, is a foundation. All of the belief in God that believes in those expectations. Now, um, there are broad categories of wisdom literature. Some of them are, for instance, um, popular proverbs, not just from the book of Proverbs, but elsewhere as well, that express practical truths, how to raise your kids, how to find a good wife, uh, you know, uh, how not to fall victim to easy money, um, how not to fall victim to immoral women, you know, very practical kinds of stuff. The second group after the practical truths for living are riddles or parables that have spiritual meaning. You know, there are, there are riddles in the, in the books of wisdom. And then the third are discussions about the problems of life. Good examples of that would be the book of Job and the book of Ecclesiastes. Job goes through a series of, of discussions between Job and his friends about how it is that he, a righteous man, has suffered and lost everything, literally. Um, the book of Ecclesiastes is, is a, a monologue. It's... Koheleth, he's called, the teacher, um, is talking about what the meaning of life is. And yet, so those are examples of discussions about the problems of life. Um, as I mentioned, the Psalms do not, are not entirely wisdom literature. The Psalms get into a whole lot of different styles and forms. There, there are a list of different types of Psalms, including Messianic Psalms, for instance. But particularly when we look at wisdom literature, we could consider Psalm 1, 4, you don't have to write this down, 1, 4, 10, 14, 18, 19, 37, 49, 73, 90, 112, clearly are examples of what we call wisdom literature. Counsel for how to live a good life. Discussion about how we are supposed to be consistent with God's will, how we are supposed to live our lives, okay? Um, one of the fascinating things about the wisdom literature is that it shows us that the Israelites of the time in which the wisdom literature was written, and it was written over a thousand year period, all right? the oldest of them probably was uh, about the time of Moses, the earliest Psalms. There are Psalms of Moses, for instance, about 1500, up until probably 500, the time of Ezra, because we believe that Ezra uh, contributed to some of the Psalms and some of the other writings. So there's a thousand year period, but through that whole period of time, one of the things we should take great reassurance and comfort in is the Israelites were struggling with some of the same practical life issues that we do. How do you discipline an unruly child? Okay? Hasn't changed. And the wisdom literature gives us direction on all of those kinds of things. Um, and it also assures us because it tells us that God values and responds to those kinds of questions. So the wisdom literature, in, in one way, more than any of the rest of the Old Testament for us as people living real lives, is the most practical of all. It is practical admonitions, directions, instructions, teaching about how to live your life in the right way. Okay? 
but not there's sort of an underlying assumption about the nature of God and His will for us. It doesn't. It, it feels like the wisdom literature doesn't feel like they need to hammer on that. That's already been done. That was done in the law. That was done in the prophets. God demonstrated it through the historical events of the history books. All of that is assumed when you get into the wisdom literature, and they go straight to issues of real practical living. Right? In any ways, some of, this is some of my favorite stuff in the Bible. Okay? All right, I want to go through a number of points here, and I confess to you that after I put all these together, I realized that this isn't in any real order. <laughs> it's, they're just observations about the wisdom literature that hopefully will give you an understanding of what this is all about. Uh, first, as I said, in the ancient Near East, wisdom literature was a genre, and in every case, it deals with practical answers to existential questions. Existential, in case you haven't studied philosophy, means um, as we live it. All right? Existentialism is about human life. It's about living life. So the, the existential questions about God, humanity, creation, evil, suffering, parenting, you know, marriage, life, etc., etc., etc. Um, secondly, the, the wisdom literature of the Old Testament includes Job, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes, as I said. Sometimes they add Song of Songs, and at least part of the Psalms, as I just read to you. But for the sake of it just being a group in the Bible, we don't break Psalms up and say, okay, this, it's, the five books are called the books of wisdom, or sometimes the books of poetry. Um, now, in addition to those books, Job's Proverbs, Job, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, and Psalms, the Catholic Church adds the apocryphal or deuterocanonical books of Ecclesiasticus. That's different than Ecclesiastes. <coughs> All right? Ecclesiasticus, it's also called Sirach. It is the, the, the wisdom of Jesus ben Sirach. Okay, is the original name of it. It's called Sirach or Ecclesiasticus. And they also add the wisdom of Solomon. Now, those two books are in the Apocrypha. They are not in our Protestant Bible. So we're not going to talk about them in this class. But you do need to know that if you, if you go online and you look up wisdom literature, Christian, or Christian wisdom literature, or Old Testament wisdom literature, it's liable to include those. And so don't be shocked by that. It may also tell you that there are sections of other Apocryphal books, like uh, Tobit, or um, Second Esdras, which is another name for Ezra, that they, they will include portions of those as being identified as wisdom literature. But, again, not the wisdom books, but wisdom literature as a, as a genre, we can also identify there are wisdom writings in the New Testament. The parables of Jesus are a perfect example of that. When Jesus is giving instruction on how to make moral decisions or how to, you know, you know, the parable of the talents. Don't just you know, bury everything in a hole. You have a responsibility to use it in order to get something out of it. Those are examples of practical living advice. And also the book of James is considered a New Testament wisdom book because it talks about practically how to live. It talks about holding your tongue and the dangers of the tongue, and et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So the, the genre exists in other places as well. It's, it's worth noting because I've said that a lot of different cultures have had wisdom literature. It could even be said that every culture, um, one characteristic of a culture is that it devotes itself to gathering and preserving experiential knowledge. What have we learned? It especially does that, what have we learned about life and how to live it, in order to pass it on, especially to their children. Every culture has some kind of training plan for their kids. And wisdom literature is where they capture those things. The book of Proverbs uses the term, uh, you know, my son, over and over and over and over again. And my father is used, my, the mother is used. It's a very family-oriented kind of book because it involves training children in the way that they should grow up. Okay. Um, and in Old Testament wisdom literature reflects the specifically ancient Israelite efforts to capture their experiential knowledge. What have we learned with the foundation of a belief in God and His will for us? What have we learned about how to live our lives? Now, the wisdom literature of the Old Testament, therefore, might be called God's word written in human experience. 
It's a very practical collection of knowledge gained from general revelation. You guys remember general and special revelation? Those of you who have been in the class? Special revelation is when God speaks a specific word to us. The written word is special revelation, God's specific instruction. But in addition to that, a second kind of revelation called general revelation is creation and the use of our reason. Um, the Psalms talk about the fact that in the glory of God's creation, we can see His Him manifest. If we're paying attention, when we use our reason correctly, then we can understand the awesomeness of God. Now, this is important to realize that the difference between wisdom and foolishness is how we use our perceptions and how we use our reason. If we are using them wisely, consistent with what wisdom literature tells us, we will see the things of God in that. If we are using them as fools, then we will come up with all sorts of explanations that do not include God. So very specifically, the wisdom, uh, the wisdom writings of the Old Testament are taking our general revelation and applying wisdom to it so that we can see the things of God in the created world and in our ability to reason through things. Does that make sense? This is why when we talk about general revelation that God is evident in, in nature, he is evident when we use our reason, and you go, well, not always. Well, not if we don't use it wisely. Not if we don't use it in a way consistent with wisdom. And that's what these writings are about, is teaching us how to use our observation of nature and our reason in, a ways, that, in ways that are wise, so that we do see the things of God in them. Okay? And that's very important. Whenever I've taught about special and general revelation, I say, well, uh, somebody will usually say, well, yeah, but, you know, people come up with all these rationalistic explanations that exclude God very specifically. Well, that's because they are talking as fools, not as the wise. And a fool doesn't mean a stupid person. It means a person who is not using wisdom. They can be very smart, but not be wise, and therefore the wisdom literature would call them fools. Okay? Now, again, the wisdom writings are consistent with the law of Moses. They don't discard any of the law or any of the prophetic statements. It's just that it, um, it recognizes that the law may not be directly uh, applicable <coughs> to a life situation. There's nothing in the, you know, in the Ten Commandments or in most of the 613 mitzvot, the commandments of the Old Testament, that tell you what to do with your child every time you try to talk to them storms out of the room, slams the door. Well, that's the kind of thing that it's hard to figure out, okay, what did Moses say about this? But you can say, what did the writer of Proverbs say about this? So, in the gaps where the law of Moses, or the statements of the prophets, are not clearly or directly applicable, the wisdom writings come in. With the understanding and the and the substrat, the sublayer of the law of Moses and the teaching of the prophets underneath that. But the wisdom writings get down to the nitty-gritty of how you interpret those things and apply them to the real situation of life. Pretty cool, huh? Okay. Um, all right. Now, again, the wisdom writings differ from the law and the prophets particularly because they don't rely on thus saith the Lord kind of revelation. You know, um, the prophets were speaking. You've got, in the Old Testament, you've got the priests and the prophets are the ones who spoke the word of God or practically applied God's law to the lives of the people. Uh, the wisdom writings don't, don't, don't declare thus saith the Lord. They don't quote the prophets. They just sort of cut through all of it to, okay, here's how you need to act. Here's what you need to do. Here's how to deal with that situation. Uh, so you don't get the grand statements of God's, God's voice in that. But his presence and revelation are never dismissed. They're just assumed. They are consistent with all of the Jewish theistic and ethical uh, creeds. So none of that is discarded. They just don't have to mention it anymore. They cut through all that. But all of that's the background. And, whoops, that's one of the other things I've learned. Can't push that button. Don't push that button. <laughs> All right. Um, general ethical and religious topics are the things that it deals with without any effort to a philosophical system. Now, what do I mean by that? All right. 
A philosophical system would say, what is the meaning of life? Wisdom writings don't do that. In fact, none of the Old Testament usually gets to that. Instead, it says, how do you live? So it doesn't deal with it philosophically, it deals with it instead very practically. We can even say that, um, what's that all about? Those came out in the wrong order. The ancient Hebrews were not, did not tend to be a philosophical people. They didn't write, there is no philosophy per se in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. Again, they don't ask questions like, what is the meaning of life? They say, what did God say and how do we live? Unlike the Greeks, the most perfect knowledge, according to the Jewish people, would be a knowledge, uh, not a rational analysis, because that's why rationality was considered the highest of all values to the Greeks, not to the Jews. The highest of all values to the Jews was God's revelation, and then how you apply that in real life situations, without asking questions like, what is the meaning of life? It would never occur to, a, to a, an Orthodox Jew, especially in the Old Testament, to say, is there a God? I mean, don't let him hear you say that, you know, uh, because the assumption was there. So they did not have a philosophical system, unlike the Greeks or others. They, they went from the belief in the, in, the, in the existence of God, the reality of God, straight to how do we going to apply that in their lives. And then, that's why the Hebrew wisdom literature sees the existence of Jewish law and custom, given by God as the basis of right conduct, not philosophical arguments. See, the, the Greeks would say that the reason why you should be good is because that's necessary for the health of the state, for the health of the family, or because if you don't, somebody will nuke you. Fear of reprisal. Those were the Greek reasons, the Greek philosophical reasons for doing the right thing. <clears throat> the Jews were not motivated by that. Now, they would, they, they would say, as I say here, Ecclesiastes does talk about the fact that if you do the wrong thing, you'll get punished. But that's not the real reason for doing the right thing. Doing the right thing is because God told you what the right thing was. And yes, your family will be healthier and happier if you do the right thing, but that's not why you do the right thing. You do the right thing because God told you to do the right thing. And now let's talk about how that gets applied. You see the difference? Uh, it's interesting that within the, the Hebrew wisdom literature, there's two very different strands or ways of approaching this issue of understanding God's will and how we live our lives. There's a positive strand and a negative strand. Proverbs is a good example of the positive strand because what it will say is that if you, you know, if you do these things, then you will be happy. You will have a good life. You, know, you will be pleasing to God. Your family will be strong. It, I mean, all those things, it does identify those things are real, but the main reason for doing them is because God says to but it's very positive. There's the idea that there's an optimism about our ability to use our minds, our ability to use our understanding, that God gave us it for the understanding and minds and rationality and reason for all of those things in order to do the right thing. And it's, it's quite positive. You then have the second strand, first one being the positive strand. The second one is the negative strand, in which they get at the same issues, but they do so by coming at it from a very negative what seems a skeptical or sometimes even a pessimistic approach. Can you think of any good examples of that in the wisdom writings? The negative strand? Think about the book of Job. You know, why are you doing this to me, God? I'm a righteous man. I have not done anything. I don't deserve this. And then you get all of his friends saying, well, you must really suck, or else God would not have done this to you. And, and Job consistently says, no, I have not done anything wrong. I don't deserve this. And then God comes back at the end and clarifies everything. Um, or the book of Ecclesiastes. Vanity, vanity. All is vanity and a chasing after the wind. Talk about negative. Now by the end of the book, he comes back around to understanding that God is in charge and the meaning of life is you find work that's worth doing. You take pleasure in the things God gives you pleasure for. You commit yourself to the right. That's what our life is for. Okay. Still not exactly a you know, party-happy kind of approach. So what you see, there are some parts of wisdom literature that start with a positive orientation, that we are using God's gifts to us of rationality and reason in our lives to find positive meaning. And then there's the negative strand, like Job and Ecclesiastes, which sees the, in a, a negative, even skeptical kind of way um, what 
what life is all about. Now, um, it's important too, when we read the Old Testament history books or the pro prophetic books, you sort of get the feeling that at every possible moment in the life of the Hebrew people, that some prophet was declaring the word of the Lord and some major disaster was occurring to show them what they'd done wrong. Okay? It feels like it because that's what that talks about. But the thing we have to realize is within the history books, within the prophetic writings, there are long gaps in between. Sometimes a generation will pass between this major event in which God demonstrated himself in a historical event or, or this declaration by a prophet. Well, it was in those gaps when there wasn't a thus saith the Lord. It was in those time periods that we don't hear about all the major events that God is manifesting or all the major words God is giving to the prophets. Those are the times, especially when the wisdom literature got applied. Okay? Because, again, we read it and we think, boy, every moment, you know, there was a prophet declaring God's word and there was a major event happening and God was raising the Assyrians and then, you know, the following Tuesday the Babylonians came in and, you know, everything. Else. No, there were long periods of time in which there wasn't a thus saith the Lord happening. And the wisdom literature is what fills those gaps in the lives of the Israelites. Okay? Any questions about any of that? Well, I've got, I've got more if I stop pushing that button. <laughs> so wisdom writings reflect a distinct approach to life. That's one thing. It's not just answering the questions. But the, the issue is how do we live out our commitment to God first in a very deliberate, practical, and rational or reasonable way? Um, and I just said this, you know, the, the idea of in between the times. They had to figure out how to discipline an unruly child, how to teach the children what they needed to know become, to become worthy adults, which is something we don't know enough of anymore. We don't take the, the focus of saying to our children, you're going to become an adult now, and you need to learn how to do that right. We sort of just let it slide. We get what we get, and unfortunately that's not too good sometimes. The dangers of gossip and slander, the need for hard work, the dangers of wealth, why wicked people seem to prosper, the dangers of immoral behavior, why people suffer, etc., etc. These are about as practical as you get. And they did not involve a thus safe the Lord. Now, let's talk for a few minutes about Hebrew wisdom being rooted in the reverence for God. First, they started with the assumption that God is the creator both of people and of the physical world. And all wisdom begins with that understanding. You start believing that all of this is, is, a, is made by God. Everything. People, the physical world. This is why the doctrine of creation theologically is so important, by the way. Because if we disconnect the created world from a belief in God, then we have lost a connection that is necessary for us to have right understanding, for us to have wisdom. So the wisdom literature starts with that. Everything was made by God, period. Then, contrary to the Greeks, oh, actually that was already up there, so I don't know why this stuff is coming up all at once, but um, number two, <clears throat> God ordained that all of creation was good, and God said, during the days of creation, and it was good, and at the end he said it was very good. The nature and purpose of all of creation is designed and directed by the Creator, and from the created world, we can learn of God and His purpose by a right or wise perception of creation. Not foolish perception, but wise. Again, back to that general revelation. So these are kind of the how this is rooted in reverence for God. One, God made everything. Second, He made it good. And again, that's contrary to the Greek idea. Keep turning forward this that the Greek idea was that the spiritual, the numinous, was good, but that the physical was actually bad. It was something to be overcome. This takes its, its most radical form in Gnosticism, which was based in Greek philosophy, even though it moved into Christianity. We're going to talk about that in uh, the New Testament class this afternoon. The idea that the physical world is evil. A lot of... of Ancient Eastern religions believed that the physical world was evil, and that the effort was to try to overcome it or get past it in order to be purely spiritual. That is not Judaism, and that is not Christianity. So the Jewish wisdom literature very plainly was contrary to Greek philosophy in saying God made the world good. 
And we can find his goodness in it. That doesn't mean it's not broken in places. But at its core, God made it good. And then finally, we have responsibilities to find God's truth and his purpose in that created world, and then to learn how to live within the harmony that, that, of that divinely created order. That's what wisdom is. God made it. God made it good. How can we perceive it and understand it in such a way that we live in harmony with the order that God has created? And apply that to everyday life. That's wisdom. That's what the books of wisdom are about. Now, in wisdom thinking, there's no grounding in prophetical priestly authority. I've said that several times already. Meaning, they didn't need a prophet to declare, thus saith the Lord. They didn't need a priest to say, here's how we apply the law of Moses. Instead, the idea is that God made us, God created the situation, and if we are seeking Him and have Him as the foundation, we believe God made it, we believe God made it good, we're seeking to live His will in it, then our very human experience can give us wisdom in how to live that life. Again, that's a general revelation kind of understanding. Traditional uh, tradition often represents the wisdom of experience. You guys have seen Fiddler on the Roof. What's the most popular song from that? Tradition! <laughs> Tradition! Why were the Jews so oriented toward that? Because they believed that tradition reflected the wisdom of experience. That the foolish stuff gets filtered out over a period of time because wisdom works better, and so tradition will reflect the wisdom of how to live in an acceptable way within in harmony with God's created order. And that's why tradition was so important to the Jewish people. It's also reflected um, in the, the traditional social structures, in the family, in the king, in the royal court, in schools of wise elders. They would have schools that would be founded by a sage, a wise man, like a Hillel or a Maimonides or Gamaliel, and then that would proceed for generations and generations and generations with the passing down of wisdom. So that the tradition of those schools became very, very powerful. That's why in the Jewish faith, the interpretations of the law and the prophets always involved quoting somebody from the past. This is one of the things that was different about Jesus that nobody quite understood. And they talk about it in the New Testament. Everybody else refers to the authority of somebody who came before them, but not you, they would say. We've never heard anybody teach like you. You don't quote somebody else the tradition of wisdom that has been passed down. You speak of your own authority. And it was so unusual because that's not the way the Jews acted. They focused on tradition and what had been passed down as reflecting God's wisdom for their lives. Now, and those wisdom perspectives... Um, don't expect or demand radical change. It's not going to change like this. It's going to change over generations if it's going to change. Movement is slow because wisdom develops over time. It learns, it adjusts, experience gives us new direction. It is not a right now, I mean, if I go online and I try to order something and they tell me it's going to be there in three weeks, I go, forget you, Amazon Prime will get it here in 48 hours. <laughs> That's how we think, right? That's not the Hebrew wisdom approach. The Hebrew wisdom approach said it takes time for this stuff to get sorted out. All right? Generations of teaching to understand fully. And the last screen, and then we're going to take a break here. Um, the wisdom's concern is everyday life and how to live it well. Again, I keep repeating myself because all of this sort of, there's this big circle of truths related to the wisdom literature. And I keep circling it. All of the issues that we face as humanity, whether it was a Jew facing it 2,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, or us facing it today, um, that's what wisdom literature is concerned about. Not the unique events of history that, you know, when the law was given or when the Exodus occurred or when. You know, when uh, Elijah defeated the, the prophets of Baal, these grand events, that's not what this is all about. This is the everyday stuff. The wisdom literature is little concerned with history, politics, the acts of God, miracles, sin, forgiveness, or guilt. It doesn't deal with that stuff. Those are all really spiritual issues. 
The wisdom literature is concerned with the mundane aspects like raising children, providing economic security, finding an appropriate spouse, etc. The day-to-day -day reality not of, of real life, not the spiritual issues. There's virtually nothing in here. Now, they may say some things are not according to God, God's will, and you could say, well, they're talking about sin there, but they never talk about it in that way. They talk about it in a very practical, living it out kind of way. The focus is not mythical or spiritual. It's concerned with practical stability and order, how to live well with God, with others, and with the world. And the truths are not unique to Israel. And again, this is one of the reasons this is so valuable to us. These truths are true for all humanity at all time. Everybody who has ever lived as a human being has had these same problems. And so this stuff is for us. That's the reason God has allowed it to be passed down to us from as long ago as 3,500 years, from the very earliest of the, of the wisdom writings. Any questions about any of that? Okay, let's take a break. Obviously, we're going to open up each of these books in the weeks ahead, but, ahead, but I wanted to spend a few minutes today and kind of give you a, a real brief overview so that you kind of, kind of know what you're looking for and how these things apply to the idea of wisdom literature. The first of the books we're going to study is the book of Job. As I said earlier, Job is one of the most important uh, books of literature in human experience because it is both very ancient. We're not exactly sure when Job was written, but we believe that the period that it's talking about was the time of the patriarchs. In other words, we believe that the character Job, that the, the, it takes place, whether there was a historical figure called Job or not, it takes place during the time period that is similar to Abraham. It's possible it may actually have been first written, some version of it, as early as the patriarchs, which means 2,000 years BC, 4,000 years ago. Um, another, some scholars believe that while the events may have occurred back then and the story may have been passed down, that Job as we have it today was written much later, probably perhaps during the time of Solomon. Okay? But it is, in terms of its content, one of the very oldest books, um, Probably Genesis and Job, my belief is that they, they are probably the two oldest books in, in the Old Testament. Um, written similar times, Job may be a little bit older. Uh, Genesis, we believe, was written around 1500, uh, 1400s to 1500s, around the time of Moses and the Exodus. So Job was, I believe, then or earlier. Again, some people believe it comes later than that. The whole issue of Job is... Um, the question of suffering, especially suffering for someone who doesn't deserve it. And that's one of the reasons it's been so important as a book for human history, even people who aren't religious, who aren't Jewish, who aren't Christian, who aren't religious. The book of Job has been looked at as just because of its struggle, even if they don't agree with the conclusion it comes to, the idea of it struggling with the existence of suffering in the world. Suffering, if you remember from our theology classes, um, the existence of suffering in a world which we believe was created and is maintained by a good and loving God, who is all-powerful, is one of the most important questions that theology has to address. In fact, it's so important, there's a special word for it, it's called theodicy. How can there be suffering, especially undeserved suffering, in a world that is it was created and is run by a God who is both all-powerful and all-loving? That question and how you deal with it is called a theodicy. Job is the most ancient of all theodicies that we have. In the, the book of Job, it starts out, I'm just going to take that off there. It's, now I've got to use that button in the right way. <laughs> Job starts out with a heavenly de debate between God and Satan. And Satan is um, you know, presenting himself to God, and God brags on Job and says, Oh, well, Satan, what do you think of my servant Job? He is true in honoring me and everything. And Satan says, well, of course. You're giving him everything. The guy's rich. He's got more stuff than Barbie. You know? <laughs> He's got children and herds and flocks and houses and you know, on and on and on. And you take that stuff away from him and see how long he worships you. And so God gives Satan permission to take his stuff away, but not to harm Job. So his flocks are stolen. His house is burned. His children uh, are killed. And he still doesn't deny God. In fact, his wife says, why don't you just curse God and die? And Job says this beautiful thing, do we acknowledge God only for the good things that come and not for the bad? 
Well, then Satan comes back to God. God says, eh, told you, Satan, he didn't give up on me. And Satan says, yeah, but he still got his help. You know? uh, and so the devil says, or the Lord says, well, you can, you, know, you can hurt him, but you can't kill him. And so all of a sudden he's afflicted by sores and terrible disease, and he's sitting on this ash heap outside of his, you know, his burned down house, scraping his sores with a, with a piece of broken pottery, and it's just awful. And his friends, then his friends come along, and they're all telling him how awful he is, and that's why he's suffering. Well, and, and Job keeps insisting, no, I have not done anything wrong. So the, the book of Job is broken up into three sections. It starts out with the presentation of the dilemma of Job, how Job is righteous and God has blessed him, but then he, uh, he, the devil is given permission to try him. Then we have the majority of the book, of the, the chapter 3 through 37, are the debates of Job, where his three friends, and then a fourth character, Elihu, who comes along, who apparently is younger because he says when he starts out, I haven't said anything because you know, I felt like it was impolite to you old guys for me to intercede. But Elihu comes in and does not accuse Job of being bad, but that God is using this to teach him and train him and make him better, which is half a right answer. Uh, and then the deliverance of Job, the last chapters, verses, uh, chapter 32 to 42, uh, 38 to 42, excuse me, where uh, God comes and speaks to Job and says, you question what I've done. Who are you to question me? Were you there when I created the universe? Were you there when I measured the span of the heavens? Were you there when the angels, the sons of glory, first sang praise for the making of the universe? And it goes on, and the basic conclusion is, and, and there's not a sense, not unless you want to read it, read it with an unreasoned skepticism, there's not a sense in which God is rubbing Job's nose in it. He's just stating as a matter of fact that Job, you're not in a position to question me. You don't understand enough. You don't have enough background. You don't have enough vision to be able to really challenge the things that I do. And Job accepts that. That, you know, you're right. You're God and I'm not. And then God blesses Job again with more than he had in the first place. None of that which is intended to be a promise that God will you know, always give you everything if you if you're obedient to him, but uh, it, does, it happens in the case of, of Job. So that's the book of Job. And in the course of the arguments from his three friends, uh, and then Elihu coming in, the younger man, giving an observation, and all of them are wrong. In fact, at the very end, um, they are so wrong, the three friends, not Elihu so much, but th the three friends who have been accusing Job are so wrong that God says, you know, Job, I'm going to, I'm going to judge them unless you pray for them. Job intercedes for his friends, and God does not punish them. But they were so wrong in their understanding of God, that God was prepared to punish them for it. So this whole struggle of what is the nature of suffering, especially undeserved suffering, which ends up with a recognition of God's infinite greatness, of his, his majesty beyond any of our human you know, limitations, and that ultimately we must accept that, that our knowledge is limited, and then God has power to do whatever He wishes over creation. You know, this is an interesting thing um, tomorrow in our theology class, just my theology class, we're going to be talking about God's providence. And this is one of the one of the great statements in Scripture about the providence of God. Providence is, after God created the world, how does He then run it? Providence is, how does God interact with His world after the creation? Well, the big questions that come in about providence is, well, what about when evil happens? What about when bad things happen? And most people whip out on that. Most people actually become deists and say, well, God didn't actually do it. God just started it all, and then it's all running according to certain things. That's deism. That's not Christianity. Okay. And God's answer to Job is exactly that. Don't, don't assume that stuff just happens, Job, and don't assume that you understand enough to be able to criticize me for it, because you are not God. That's a statement about God's providence. Okay. And so, very powerful. So we'll talk about providence tomorrow if you're in the system of the other. The next book that we're going to talk about is the book of Psalms. Psalms is the largest book in the Bible, and it is perhaps the most widely used book in the Bible. Um, whatever other Bible reading plans you have, usually it'll involve Psalms. We, we do lectionary readings on Sunday morning in our church, or anybody who uses the Revised Standard Lectionary. You will read an Old Testament passage from somewhere, a New Testament passage from somewhere, a gospel, and 
either a psalm or a proverb, usually psalms, as a, we use them as a responsive reading. So uh, the psalms contain uh, a full range of human experience, from the greatest of, of joy and praise to the depths of despair. The book of Psalms captures all of that. As I said, there are a number of Psalms that are considered wisdom writings, although we look at the whole book of Psalms as being one of the wisdom books of the Bible. Um, the original name in Hebrew was the Sefer Tehillim, which means the book of praises, because most of the book of Psalms is involved in praising God. Psalms literally comes from the, the Greek term salvoi, which means a sung poem poem that is sung to the accompaniment of instruments. And so the Psalms, or the Psalter, which is the Psalter is the name of the Psalms when they're put together in a book, became the songbook of the ancient Hebrews, and some Christian denominations have used the Psalms. Uh, interestingly enough, some of the denominations that insist that they can only use Psalms for singing are also some of the denominations that say that it is against God's will to use musical instruments, when in fact the Psalms were all written. For, by, by definition for use with musical instruments. And they talk about lyres and timbrels and cymbals and all that kind of stuff in the Psalms. Yet my grandmother belonged to a, a to a offshoot of the Church of Christ, which believed that using musical instruments of any kind in the church was a sin. And I'm going, where do you guys get this? <laughs> okay. Um, so, it's also true that no other book in the Bible has more authors than the book of Psalms. Now, the majority of the Psalms, the, or the largest single section of them, were attributed to David. David's is actually assigned uh, authorship of 73 of the Psalms in the Psalms. And then we are told in the New Testament, two other Psalms, Psalm 2 and Psalm 95, were also written by David. Not all of the Psalms have an attribution in terms of the author. So we believe 75 psalms total were written by David. 12 were ascribed to Asaph, who was a priest responsible for the service of music in the temple. Um, 10 of them were written by the sons of Korah, which were a guild of singers and composers. And then other psalms are ascribed to Solomon, Moses, um, uh, Heman the Ezraite, and Ethan the Ezraite. And there are some that are traditionally uh, ascribed to Ezra. Now again, these were written over a long period of time between as old as 1500, because Moses, that's when Moses was alive, 15, 14 to 1500, and he is identified as the author of some of the Psalms, all the way down to Ezra around 500, so a thousand year span. In terms of the wisdom writings, that is both the Psalms represent the oldest and the newest of the wisdom writings. Originally, the Psalms were individual poems. They were individual poems intended to be sung to musical instruments. They then later on started being gathered together into smaller books, and then eventually those smaller books were all put together into one book. Um, and that is what we know as the Book of Psalms. But in the Book of Psalms, sometimes even in Bibles, it will break them up into five books. Book one of the Psalms, book two of the Psalms, etc., up through book five. Um, Psalm, the, the first book is the first 41 Psalms. The second book is Psalm 42 to 72. The third book is Psalm 73 to 89. The fourth book is 90 to 106. And the fifth book is Psalm 107 to 150. In the Apocrypha, it's the 151st Psalm. That's one of the books of the Apocrypha, if you're interested. Um, we believe the oldest of the Psalms was probably um, Psalm 90, written by Moses. And the, the newest of the Psalms is probably Psalm 137. Uh, which we believe is from the 500s and probably was from Ezra. There are a lot of different uh, types of psalms. As I said to you, I gave you a list earlier of the ones that are considered wisdom psalms or wisdom literature psalms. But we have um, individual and communal lament psalms, which are prayers for, in times of distress, calling for God's deliverance, the lament psalms. There are thanksgiving psalms, and when we get into the, deep, the class on the psalms, I'll give you more detail about this stuff. Um, there are enthronement psalms, which describe God's sovereign rule. There are pilgrimage psalms, which were sung by worshipers as they traveled to Jerusalem to celebrate the Jewish festivals. There are royal psalms, which praise the earthly king, especially the King David, the king of Israel. There are wisdom psalms, as I said, that instruct the worshiper in ways of wisdom and righteousness. There are imprecatory psalms, in which the worshiper invokes God's wrath and judgment against his enemies. 
those are the ones that, you know, included in that are the ones about bashing baby's heads against the rocks, which we have a whole lot of trouble reading, but those are, you know, psalms for God's judgment against evil and enemies. And then I mentioned the Messianic Psalms, the Psalms which identify the coming of the Messiah, which we interpret now as being um, clearly linked to the reality of the historical Jesus. All right? Any questions about any of that? No one will get into detail. You're grinning. Yeah, is there something? I'm just thinking about bashing out people's feet like the one song. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. I actually, um, I was gone one time. Um, and somebody else had put together the program of worship and they had they had picked the psalm that involved that included bashing babies' heads against the rocks. And when Peril, somebody told me when they the person read it, uh, that somebody in the congregation went, Oh my <laughs> You know, and I had people coming to me about that. And it is in God's word. That doesn't mean we necessarily want to use it as part of our regular worship. But uh, you know, it is in it is in the word. We can't just deny it, and the fact is that, you know, that was the appeal that David or others made against those who they felt were violating God's will and, and oppressing them. So, anyway. Just a question. Yes. Maybe it's a full question. Uh, in Psalm 119, it's always uh, a Hebrew letter yep. between certain words. Well, that, those are the Hebrew letters in order. And the start of each of those sections begins with that Hebrew letter. There are other places, and we'll talk about this in more detail when we talk about the Psalms in uh, two weeks. Uh, the, Psalms, the Psalms are Hebrew poetry in its highest form. The very best of Hebrew poetry are in the Psalms. And there are a number of different uh, processes that the Hebrew, or structures that the Hebrew poetry uses. One of them is parallelism, where it has things running parallel. It'll make a statement and then counter it. It will use numbers. And some of the things that it does is it will use letters. You know, there are psalms that start, the first verse starts with the first letter of the alphabet, the second verse starts with the second letter, the third with the third letter, etc. Psalm 119, which is the longest of all the psalms, is broken up in sections, each of which starts with that Hebrew letter and so is identified by that Hebrew letter with each of those sections. I'll give you some examples of that when we get into it, but it's actually, that's quite common in poetry and other forms as well. If you took if you took literature classes and you studied various poetic forms, like haiku is an obvious one, you know, the three-line Japanese poems, where there's a very specific structure you have to follow. There are others that follow um, rhythmic patterns, like A, A, B, B, C, right? Remember studying that stuff? Or A, B, A, B, C. Um, Hebrew poetry is the highest form, probably, of that, other than maybe Japanese poetry, where they use a very tight structure, sometimes using certain letters, or even, even sometimes using numbers. A very common thing which we'll, you'll read in the Psalms is it will say, um, of the things God desires, there are three, four things God wishes for us. That three, four kind of thing, or six, seven, that's another sort of structure that they so we'll get into that. I'll probably use Psalm 119 as an example of that when we talk about the use of those letters. But it's a poetic form is what it is. Okay. Okay, the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs, which traditionally has been attributed to Solomon, is get, gives detailed instructions to God's people on how to deal with, with a number of different issues in everyday life. How to relate to God, how to be parents, how to treat your children, how to relate to neighbors, how to relate to the government. How not to be overtaken by the love of money, you know, how not to be given in, not giving into pride, not taking uh, the offer of immoral women, you know, all of those kinds of things. The Hebrew title of the book is Mishle Shlomo, which means the parables of Solomon. That's the traditional name, and these are attributed to Solomon. Although uh, there are other, uh, most of the Solomons are uh, the Proverbs are attributed to Solomon, but there are two other figures which are named as being authors for section, smaller sections, Agur, the son of Jackie, and King Lemuel, neither one of whom we know anything about. So there are at least three authors of these, um, of these sections. Um, if the Proverbs that Solomon wrote, he would have had to have been written before 931 BC, which is the date we believe that Solomon died. And uh, a lot of the, because some of them came after Solomon, we believe the book as we have it now was collected by Hezekiah, um, the king, Hezekiah, about 230 years after the time of Solomon. 
but most of it we do believe traditionally was written by Solomon. The, uh, one of the interesting things I find about the, the book of Proverbs is the places in which wisdom is actually personified, is presented as though it were a woman particularly, but that wisdom is, uh, there's a personification. And in the Greek translation for wisdom, that, that personified wisdom is often translated as logos, which is what the same Greek word is translated as the word in the New Testament, especially in the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. That word in Greek is logos. In Greek philosophy, especially uh, Philo of Alexandria, who was a Jewish Greek philosopher, he was Jewish, but he was very much a Greek orientation. Um, logos was developed as being not only personification of wisdom, but sort of the, the reason and rationale behind everything. And so the personification of wisdom in Proverbs can very much be seen as a prophetic foretelling of the, uh, the, the Word, who is Jesus Christ in the New Testament. And so there's some fascinating connections between those things. Um, I'm going to move along pretty quickly here. We've got about uh, 23 more minutes. All right. Uh, let's talk about the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes has always been one of my favorite books, especially in, more, in my more skeptical days, um, because Ecclesiastes, which again is traditionally attributed to Solomon, because it starts out saying the words of the preacher, Koheleth in Hebrew. Um, Ecclesiastes, the word actually means the preacher, or, or the because uh, Ecclesia. You guys that speak Spanish, uh, Ecclesia. Ecclesia is the Greek word for church. Ecclesiastes is one who speaks to a church or an assembly. And so the word literally means the preacher. The Hebrew word for that, uh, for that Greek Ecclesiastes, the Hebrew word is Koheleth. And the book starts with the words of Koheleth, or the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Well, the only person that fits that description is Solomon. And so this is believed to be Solomon. It's also fairly consistent with the, when you, you read this book, and it start, it's so dark in places, it's, it's so skeptical. It's also the only book of the Bible that has ever inspired a number one rock and roll song. Yes. The birds. <laughs> and everything, turn, 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 turn. There's a season, turn, turn, turn. And that's directly from the book of Ecclesiastes. Okay? Um, and... It starts out, vanity, vanity, all is vanity. And he goes through listing all of these different things. He has collected up everything that can be collected. He has had all the pleasures that can be had. He has built buildings. He has designed cities. He has done everything. And none of it gives him any satisfaction. Vanity, vanity is all vanity. As I said earlier, he then finally ends up saying, this is the nature of human life. You know, we do, be we, take we do the work that's given to us to do, we do it the best we can, we take satisfaction in it, we live life to the fullest, we, you know, we follow God, that's what life is for. And so it ends up sort of semi-reconciled, well, not completely. It is fairly consistent, if we think about this being Solomon, you'll remember that Solomon did not do too well late in his life. Okay. It's believed that Proverbs, the, so the Proverbs of Solomon were written earlier in his life when his wisdom was, was internationally known. He had asked God for wisdom to rule his people. And so the Proverbs were written earlier in Solomon's life when he still had some wisdom. Later, he falls victim to his, his both the political necessities, he thought, and the sensual desires to have many wives and many concubines. It gets him in trouble when he lets them worship other gods and you read Ecclesiastes and you say, yeah, I could see a late in life Solomon, given all of the problems that he ended up with later, the fact that he was not pleasing to God at that point, that this could very well be how he would react to life. He had lost the meaning at that point because he had turned away from God. Um, some people have a problem with that because they say that how could that be in, in Scripture? How could, how could he have been a, the author of a book of the Bible, part of the canon, the ordained book of one of the books of God? if he was late in life as Solomon and turned away from God, etc. Well, I don't have a problem with that because God can do whatever he wishes and if he chose to take exactly that set of circumstances and exactly those attitudes and teach us from it, then there's a very good reason why he could have still had this name in the Bible. Okay? Um, and it is a fascinating book. 
It really is. Um, dark. Both Job and Ecclesiastes are very dark in places. Um, but much we can learn from it. Okay? You're going to stop me if you have any questions, right? Right. Okay. So, I don't want to talk about the Song of Songs or the Song of Solomon. It starts out identifying itself as the Song of Songs or Song of Solomon. Um, in Latin, the book is called the Book of Canticles, which means in Latin, song. A canticle is a song. We get cantates from the same root. Right? Um, in some places, you will read the Canticle of Canticles. And I'm thinking, okay, come on, guys. <laughs> Chill. We don't need to go there. Most people don't know what canticle means anyway. You're saying it twice in one title. Um, so it has a number of different, different different names, different ways of translating that same thing. There are three main speakers in here. There is the bride, there is the king, and then there's a chorus, which are the daughters of Jerusalem. And it's a little confusing. It's sort of like a Russian novel. You're not always quite sure who's talking at any given time. You know, you have to really pay attention to that. Um, this is one of the books, Song of Songs and the Book of Esther, are two books which almost did not make it into the Bible. Esther almost didn't make it in, as you all know, if you took the, you know, the history books, because Esther never mentions God at all, in any way. The Song of Songs almost didn't make it into the Bible because it's about sexual love. The Song of Songs is about a romantic relationship, and it is very physical in its orientation. Now, most Jewish and Christian interpretations of it have been that it is an allegory for the relationship between God and his people Israel or between Christ and the church. Um, that's been one interpretation. The other extreme interpretation has been it is exactly what it is. It's about, it's about human love and the expression of that human love in a physical way. I, I tend to believe that it is both. You know, there's a middle path that says it is both a, a um, I think, a very respectful presentation of God's intention in human romantic love between a man and a woman, and it also is a metaphor for God's relationship with his people. And that metaphor of God's relationship with his people as being reflected by a relationship between a man and a woman is present in other places. The whole book of Hosea is about that. The book of Hosea is where the prophet Hosea is told by God to marry a prostitute named Gomer, and then Gomer runs off and leaves him apparently more than once, and each time God tells him to go back and get her. And the idea there is that Gomer represents the unfaithfulness of the Israelites in their relationship with God, just as Gomer is unfaithful in their relationship with Hosea. So God uses this, this relationship between a man and a woman as, an, as a metaphor for God's relationship with his people uh, in a number of places. And I believe this is consistent with that, but I don't think it's intended only as that. I think it also is, um, I mean, Christians who, who believe that sex is inherently evil, that it is a bad thing, obviously don't want to have this in their Bible, okay? Because I believe this is, this is a clear illustration, the fact that that is something that is given by God, okay? in the right context, in terms of, uh, of the right relationship. There's two broad sections to this book. There is the beginning of love, falling in love, being united in love is the first section, the first five, uh, four chapters and the start of chapter five. And then the broadening of love. It involves a struggle in the relationship. And then through that struggle, a growing in that. In that. One of the interesting things about the book of um, uh, the Song of Songs is that it identifies geographical locations all over the place in the Middle East from Egypt all the way up to the, the North Damascus Arab, and then all sorts of different locations in Israel and over on the Transjordan, that is, east of the Jordan River. So there are all kinds of different places identified in here in terms of geographical locations, where people came from, where they were, where they traveled to, etc. So there's some, some real interest in that regard. Um, when we get into the de more details, I will give you a, a map uh, that will show you some of that stuff. These are the five books of wisdom. They are very different, very different time periods by different authors. The thing they all have in common is that they rely not upon prophetic utterances of God or on quoting the law, but rather upon a practical understanding of God's will and applying of that will to everyday life. Whether it be raising your kids, finding a wife, you know, staying out of debt, whatever it is, 
that's what these books are all about. And so we're going to dig into them in some detail. I just wanted today that, you know, they always say that when you're giving a talk, you should tell people what you're going to tell them, then tell them, and tell them what you told them. So that's why I try to start these classes with an introduction, then the body of classes, and then a conclusion at the end. So any questions about any of that, either the wisdom literature in general, or about any of Real, real quick introduction to any of those books. Anything? Are we good? Next week we will start out with, again, one of the most important books in the history of human literature, I believe, which is the book of Job and the nature of suffering and how we're to understand it. Um, and it's always been fascinating to me that, that this, is, this has been such an important book in human, in the human experience throughout most of our known history, when, in, when the final conclusion on how to deal with suffering is trust God. That's the summary. Trust God. And yet this book has been very influential. Okay, that's it for this, this week. Um, gives me an extra 14 minutes to sit down before I have to lecture again in an hour and 14 minutes. So, <laughs> I will see some of you there. God bless you. We'll talk to you soon.